Welcome to another week in motorsport. Today it's June the 21st and currently we are closing our August issue so to be joined by the editor on deadline is is quite something I hope you appreciate. Uh, I'm going to keep it short and I'm not going to ask any stupid questions because quite frankly today I don't think he's got time for them. He spent too many hours correcting my mistakes. So today we're going to be talking about the Formula One driver movements at McLaren or the possible ones that is. We're going to be talking about the BBC and whether or not we'll be watching Formula One on it next year. Also, we'll be looking at Dario Franchetti's IndyCar season and also Citroen's World Rally Championship at the moment with Sebastian Loeb and Sebastian Ogier, currently both number one. Well, Damien, thanks again for, for joining me. Um, I think we'll start Formula One as always. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of news coming out of McLaren at the moment, or certainly from the McLaren drivers. We've heard rumours that Ferrari want Jensen Button, McLaren want him, uh, Lewis Hamilton might be going to Red Bull. Is this just all posturing by normal Formula One drivers, or is, is there a grain of truth in there? Yeah, the key word there is rumours and speculation, certainly. Um, it's difficult to tell how much truth there is in the uh, this uh, start to the silly season. Uh, the key point here is that obviously is Fernando Alonso's new five-year deal with Ferrari, which has changed things dramatically in terms of the driver market. Um, that basically means that it's very unlikely that Lewis Hamilton will be driving for Ferrari anytime soon. Um, there was lots of speculation in Montreal that he was seen talking to Christian Horner. Now, to do that publicly at a race is a very unsubtle thing to do. He knew when he sat down with Christian, no matter how innocent or otherwise the conversation might have been, that it would start things off, that uh, the media would pick up on it. Um, so I guess he's, um, he's probably, uh, there's an element of, of gamesmanship in there to, to let McLaren know that um, you know he is on the market, he's not definitely going to be staying there. Um, but it's very early days, very hard to see um, if there's a move on the cards. You have to wonder why Christian would want him at the moment. I mean, Sebastian Vettel is absolutely the man on top of, the, of his game. Um, he can lead the team for years, uh, the, way, the way they're going, and, and rack up win after win, after championship after championship. So why does he need Lewis Hamilton? You know, there's that old quote um, from Frank Williams, which has come up quite a few times recently, about two bulls in one field. Um, I mean, the, the sparks would fly um, with Vettel and Hamilton, and do Red Bull really need that? Uh, well, we'd like to see it, I think. It'd be great for us, yeah. I wouldn't really want to be in Christian Horner's shoes trying to manage those two in the same team. Um, and the same thing with, with Jensen um, being linked to, to Ferrari. I mean, it should be said that Ferrari have maintained all along that Felipe Massa will be there next year, uh, that he's not going anywhere. Having said that, they said the same thing about Kimi Raikkonen, uh, and we know what happened there. So, um, who knows? I think for Jensen, um, he's very, very comfortable at McLaren. Uh, the team love him, he's doing a great job there, uh, he's very at ease with himself, he's come to terms with the fact that he's got this extremely quick teammate in Lewis Hamilton and that Lewis will be quicker than him um, on, on many occasions, um, but, but Jensen is in a good place at the moment um, and uh, for me it's hard to see him leaving McLaren. And, and just quickly, sort of clearing something up for me, I, I think I know the answer but I'm going to ask anyway. With Lewis, we've heard you know, he will stay at McLaren as long as they can give him a competitive car. But from other people we've heard, actually what he's trying to do is negotiate a much bigger retainer from the team. Is, what's going, is it just him wanting more money? I mean, McLaren is always going to have a reasonably competitive car. It's, it's one of the best teams on the grid. Yeah, it should be noted that his management has changed and uh, Simon Fuller of sort of pop star fame is now looking after Lewis. Um, there's, there's bound to be some uh, contract negotiations in there. Lewis is extremely marketable as a personality, as a sporting global s superstar. Um, so money will be a factor, as it always is. But there's no doubting Lewis's ambition. He wants to be a multiple world champion. And if McLaren can't deliver a car that he thinks is worthy of his talent, then he will look elsewhere, and that's probably what he's doing right now. Red Bull have the fastest car. Um, you look at other eras, I mean, Ayrton Senna openly uh, courted Williams uh, when he wanted to go to Williams. He didn't hide it at all. Yeah. It's amazing how, how blatant he was about it, and, um, uh, you know, I think something similar is happening now. Lewis would be foolish not to look at Red Bull, but as I say, the question remains, do Red Bull really need Lewis Hamilton? Yeah, and at the moment you've got to, got to say no. Um, 
But uh, talking about people needing things, uh, the BBC is apparently wondering whether it needs Formula One because it costs them so much to air it. Um, and we've heard quite a few, again, rumours. Uh, what is going on? I mean, surely the Formula One, as we said a few weeks ago, cannot be pay-per-view. But it's becoming increasingly, well, worrying, I suppose. Yeah, over the weekend, the Sunday Times ran a story um, saying that the BBC will probably drop Formula One uh, in, in the near future. Um, we don't know for sure whether they will. We do know that um, it costs an awful lot of money to have Formula One on the BBC, you know, publicly funded broadcaster. Um, it can't be seen to be sp putting all its money into um, one area when there's there's uh, shortages in the arts and culture, etc. So. Um, I would say that we should take this seriously, and certainly Formula One will take this seriously. Martin Whitmarsh made some comments yesterday about what, what a um, you know, disappointment it would be and a huge devastation it would be for Formula One to lose the BBC. They do an extremely good job as the uh, UK broadcaster, um, um, but beyond the quality of what they do, um, the, the, you know, the free-to-air television is vital to Formula One and to the teams who have most of their uh, marketing strategies based around the fact that... Um, They've got, you know, how many millions of people watching every exactly. weekend. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, in the past, uh, subscription hasn't worked for Formula One at all. Um, I mean, Bernie himself tried it in the late 90s with um, his digital TV uh, setup, which uh, we used to see at the track and was superb in terms of the coverage you used to get and all the onboard cameras that the, the free-to-air TV broadcasters didn't have access to. Um, it's very Bernie, isn't it? It was very burning, yeah. Um, but the fact is that no one, uh, no one bought into the package, and and um, it failed. And Bernie, you know, he had to close it down. It was a failure for Bernie Eccleston, which doesn't happen every day. No. Uh, uh, you know, the world's changed again. This is a lot, yeah, it's a long time ago now. Maybe subscription could work now. But the fact is, the numbers will fall because as soon as you take it off free to air, that's what yeah. happens. But surely there's, there's got to be something to be said for the fact that BBC has, you know, six, seven, eight, ten, even ten million viewers on race day. Um, you know, surely it's working for them, no? Or is it, is it still too expensive? It, it, it certainly is working for them in, in viewing figures. I mean, we, we, as we covered in a, in a recent um, week in motorsport, that the figures for Spain and Monaco showed that. And again, the Canadian Grand Prix, despite that long two-hour delay, there was a huge boost in figures um, because the race was so exciting. Um, but it goes way beyond viewing figures for the BBC. They've got a lot more to contend with than just how many people um, they get tuning in on a, on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening in the Canadian case. Um, but I think um, for... Uh, Formula One, it just need. I think free to wear, uh, losing free to wear would be a huge cultural change for the for the sport, and I think it has bigger ramifications. We're talking a lot at the moment about um, the future of the sport in terms of ownership. Um, will there be another attempt at a breakaway series? If there's no free to wear TV. Uh, that could be another factor in convincing the teams that they do need to push ahead with these plans. Uh, you know, we've said in the past that um, often these these breakaway plans come to nothing because there's always a deal done. I think the threat of that breakaway is genuine, um, and the TV uh, figures and the TV money is going to be central to that because it's all about revenue for the teams. Yeah. As always, it's all about money. Yeah, but well, it's got to be when you're spending how many millions of pounds a year just just to have a couple of cars going around a track. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, all is not well at Citroen. Um, Sebastian Loeb, seven world titles under his belt, and he's suddenly joint number one with OJ. What, what's Citroen doing here? Sure, I mean, this is mindless. I, I actually don't have a problem with this. Um, and we were talking about it in the office this morning, and um, uh, you know, the fact that Sebastian Loeb, you know, undoubted star of rallying seven world championships he's had an easy time of it within the Citroen team for a long time Danny Sordo never really proved much of a threat this guy Sebastian Auger has come in and is very much a threat and um, you know can beat Loeb for pace um, so uh, Citroen have a very difficult situation again we come back to that old Frank Williams quote about the yeah. bulls in the in the field. You know, you've got two guys going head to head. Um, but it's exactly what rallying needs, that's for sure, is to have this competition, this level of competition. Um, and it's um, it's an intriguing situation. Uh, I think Loeb is rattled um, at the weekend uh, on the Acropolis. Um, 
uh, OJ played the tactical game on Saturday evening by slowing down, which meant that Loeb led into the, uh, the last day, uh, which meant he was lit first on the road, and um, there's a disadvantage because he was basically clearing the road for those following behind, and OJ ended up winning by 10 seconds because of that. Um, but sure, surely that's favouring OJ there, if, if sort of his camp lets, lets him do that. Well, Citroen, what Citroen's answer to that is that if it was the other way around, they would have backed Loeb in the same situation, and it would have happened the other way around. They're, they're kind of taking that um, uh, approach where you let both drivers uh, go for it mm. and let both you know, sets of engineers uh, compete against each other. It could backfire against them, um, but as long as they don't take points off each other, which is less likely in rallying because you're not running okay. side by side, um, it's not too much of a problem. The fact is that Loeb still has the championship lead. He's 22 points in front of Ogier with uh, Mikko Herven and uh, Ford between them. Um, so Ogier's got, still got a lot of work to do to close that gap to Loeb. Um, but it, I, you know, it's great. Yeah, I mean, hats off to Sitchin. I'm just amazed that you know, Ogier, who's won three rallies, is suddenly on the e equal pegging with, with Loeb and his, all his world titles. It's yeah, I guess if you're Sebastian Loeb, you probably feel a little bit hard done by that after years of being loyal to Citroen and you know, winning them titles, uh, as soon as some young buck comes up and can um, uh, match him for pace, they suddenly show no, no favouritism and no, no sort of um, loyalty back to Sebastian. But I don't know, it's, it's sport, isn't it? It's what it's all about. Cit Citroen are in it, in it to um, be competitive and for both cars to, to, to mm -hmm. try and win. Um, and it's great for the WRC. It's exactly what it's, it's been lacking yeah. for, for far too long. And I mean, do you think we're going to see an Alonso Hamilton thing here when, you know, Hamilton came into McLaren in 2007 was very much, you know, the number two in Alonso's eyes and just started winning races and getting, you know, regular points. And Alonso obviously didn't like it at all. I mean, is Loeb's more level-headed than that, I would have thought? So far he has been, yeah. I mean, we'll have to watch this one carefully and see how it develops. Um, but um, I think um, there are some parallels there, I suppose, to the Alonso Hamilton thing in Formula another, 1. But another tenuous one from me. It, but it, it's, <laughs> we'll, we'll see, won't we? But I think at the moment, um, as I say, Loeb is still the man in front. Um, Auger's been let off the leash and is allowed to chase him as hard as he can. Uh, and the, the biggest benefit uh, of this is for us, the fans, I think. And um, I, I think Citroen are quite within their rights to do what they're doing. Bit more news from the weekend, and Scott Dario Franchitti has equaled Rick Mears' record of 29 wins and is now also leading the championship, well, jointly with Will Power. I mean, it's, there's no stopping him, is there? It's no, it's amazing, really. I mean, uh, Frank Kitty is now 38 years old, and he seems to be in the sweet spot of his career. Um, you know, he just uh, is consistently a front runner, and is consistently notching up wins every season. Um, so now he's going for his fourth championship in five years. Um, neck and neck of willpower. I think it's going to be a fantastic second half of the season. Uh, winning at the Milwaukee Mile uh, will mean a lot to Dario. It's been a, a race that's been away for, for last year and is, is back for this year. Um, a very historical oval, the world's um, oldest oval, in fact. Um, and Dario has won there before, but it will mean a lot to him to win to win at that circuit and to be level pegging with Will going into the second half of the year. It's um, it's going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. But I think all the drivers love driving at that oval. Full stop. They all really enjoy it, the the short oval anyway. Yeah, um, and there was a bit of tension there. Uh, Dario made some comments after the race about uh, Helio Castro Neves, who seems to have this reputation these days as, as a blocker, um, and he was quite critical of, of Castro Neves. Um, so no love lost there between those two going into the second half of the year as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we're in for a, a, a cracking second half of 2011. Yeah, well, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll let you go back and, and finish the magazine. At, Only a few pages left, so we're, we're nearly there. Good, good. Not too bad. Everyone, thank you very much for watching again, and we will see you all next week for another Week in Motorsport.